you so much for coming out uh, on a, a beautiful day in the afternoon. Uh, I really do appreciate uh, that everybody came out to hear a little bit about uh, millennial students, whether you're faculty here or students as I see. Uh, it's simply a matter of trying to understand that there really does seem to be some differences, obviously, between younger generation and older generation. And when you have faculty trying to teach younger students and trying to understand their per perspective, their social background, where they come from, and what's going on in the classroom. This presentation today is not meant to be a scholarly presentation. It basically is a reflection of a year journey that I actually had last year of where I just really started struggling in a lot of my classes. Um, last year was my 40th year of teaching, and I thought, oh man, I'm really starting to lose it. I guess it's time to retire and get out of here because I just had so many problems going on in the classroom, and I couldn't solve them myself. And I thought, what is wrong with me? Where is the disconnect? So over the past year, last year fall semester, last year spring semester, I began to do some research. I had lots of conversations with college faculty at this institution, many institutions across the uh, state of Virginia, and one colleague I have up at Penn State. Just basically kind of talking about you know, do you seem to have problems with non-attendance, students coming late all the time, not turning in their work, there's a thousand excuses. And so they apparently struck a chord. And I wasn't the only one that was experiencing a lot of these problems and the solutions that all of us faculty attempted to put in place really weren't being the most, most successful. So with all these discussions, with attending conferences where this was a topic of discussion, so this is nothing new, and there is a wealth of scientific literature out there going back more than 10 years on what has happened in the classroom. What are the changes going on between students and between faculty? Right. So there I am in class, right <laughs> after class, and asking myself, so that was last year. I have to say this year is a wonderful year. My students are wonderful in all of my classes. I'm so grateful, I feel blessed, and please let that continue. This presentation uh, is not meant to stereotype in any way. Uh, it's not meant to be demeaning about millennial students. Uh, any and all of the facts and discussion that we have in these coming slides can really apply to any group, regardless of age. But 25 years of good, solid research by a variety of scholars has shown that the characteristics that are going to come up on some of these slides pertain more to millennial students, that age group. We'll define that in a minute. It pertains more to that age group than it does to any other age group. So with that said, let's take a look at what are the characteristics of millennial students. Even the numbers here, all right, you will find there's great variability. Depending upon whether you use Census Bureau data, or whether you use uh, uh, data from Pew Research, there's a whole group of think tanks out there, all studying millenni millennials. What year were they born? What is the cutoff? What is the impact? How were they raised? Millennials have a huge impact on American society. Right here on the top line, you'll see and once again, you'll find uh, early start birth dates of the millennials can go as early as uh, 1978, and the cutoff dates can go as late as 2005. So I just gathered what the Census Bureau had uh, to present this up here. So that means millennials are a, a wide stretch. They're approximately 17 to 35 years of age. Even inside of this cohort group, you will find there is a big difference between a 35-year-old millennial and a 17-year-old millennial. The big difference is, is when was the introduction of the smartphone? And the smartphone came out in about the mid-2000s, I think 2006, 2007, was when the first iPhones came out. And that really began a rapid change. So for those who were uh, on the younger side here, born in 2000, a little bit after 2000, you will see, even as young children, they were introduced to the uh, iPhone. It's not uncommon at all to go to the mall. Does anybody go to the mall anymore? Internet shopping, all right. But wherever you go out there in public, you will see 
that little small children in strollers are sitting there with mama's iPad or mama's cell phone and they're having a blast, all right? And we're talking toddlers here. So they're not reading, but they are seeing pictures. You also can load things, obviously, in the iPad that's entertaining for small children. So we're not criticizing it, but we are pointing out that there is a profound difference with the young ones today, and we have a generation that's coming up uh, after the millennials, they're called Gen Z, and we'll uh, sort of briefly touch on them uh, later on. But you will see that whole technology round the clock, always accessible, that has profoundly changed all of American society. And when you are a child growing up with it from the time you are young, or with older millennials there in the uh, middle 30s, your uh, introduction to social media and things like that didn't start till you were teenagers. So there is a difference even inside of the millennial population themselves in terms of how has this you know, cell phone, this smartphone technology really had an impact. All right, just for clarification, we see just a couple little definitions there. Gen X are the children, all right, of the next generation baby boomers, all right? So Gen Xers approximately born 65, 81 or so, baby boomers uh, born right after World War II, 46 to 64. Now look at the population numbers. Those numbers vary also. I saw numbers as uh, low as 74 for millennials, as high as 81 million. But what's important to know here is that millennials officially, it was two months ago, the US Census Bureau sent out this report, officially in the summer, millennial populations now have become the largest pop in the United States of America. That title always belonged to baby boomers. After the war, that was a time of where you had an increase in birth rates, and that population from 46 to 64, as they went along, they were always the biggest amount of people in this country. Not anymore, and the boomers are dying off, and the millennials are actually growing. We're not talking about new births, because new births would be the next generation, Gen Z, that's coming along, but millennials are growing also because of immigration, right? Oftentimes, many immigrants that come, they are young populations, and so that adds to it, and they become very Americanized and very much buy into our culture. So the point here, it's a huge impact on American society. It's not bad, but it's something that businesses have to pay attention to. Uh, education, K through 12, higher ed, uh, government, policies, you, you have to pay attention because millennials are here and they're the ones that have the greatest impact on all of us. All right, characteristics continuing. We see, and you all know, that millennials are tech technology savvy. You know everything. If you, if those of you who are my students from my classes, you know and I'm fumbling around up there and you go, go to the corner and click that. <laughs> and that's where I'm able to find and move on with whatever kind of presentation I'm trying to get to my classes. Uh, older, slower technology, I like it, it's useful, but it really is a bear to me. But if you have grown up with iPad, uh, iPhone in hand, every new change, you're proficient, you're quick, it only takes you a little short while <coughs> to do that. Now, technologically dependent, and we see addicted in parentheses there. <coughs> there is a big debate in the psychological community as to is there such a thing as technology addiction? Excuse me. <clears throat> well, the word they quibble about, but on the next slide we're gonna see <clears throat> that there are actual brain biochemical changes the more you use various forms of social media, specifically when you use iPads and your <clears throat> smartphones. Um, some data, uh, millennials tend to check their phones uh, 43 times a day spend seven or more hours a day on some type of electronic device. That's a lot of hours. You hope maybe you're sleeping <clears throat> maybe seven or eight hours a day. So how many hours are left in the day, 10 or so, for you to do other kinds of productive activity like work or school or go outside or shop and take care of your life and so on and so forth. Okay, millennials do have short attention spans, okay? There is actually a physiological reason for that, okay? The attention span that most researchers found 
was about eight minutes. And I'm gonna be in trouble really fast here, all right? I'm <laughs> something, I have to do something, I have to do a cartwheel, all right? Something to keep this thing moving along. All right, millennials tend to be easily bored, easily distracted, and have a very strong desire to multitask. Most researchers identify this term, and we all use it, I use it all the time, and I consider myself a really good multitasker. I'm running around doing all kinds of things. I'm working on, you know, on my laptop, I'm cooking dinner, I'm watching TV, you know, I'm answering phone calls, oh, I'm doing all this really great. Actually, no, we're not. And they say the word multitasking is really an incorrect term. The correct term is really switch tasking. And looking at brain physiology and how the brain actually can work, your brain can only focus on one thing at a time. So what you're doing actually when you go from the laptop to the TV to the phone or writing a note or cooking dinner or whatever you're doing, all you're doing is your brain is just switching. I'm gonna do this now, then I'm gonna do that, then I'm gonna do this, gonna do that. Doesn't mean you can't do it successfully, but the chances are that you're probably not going to do it as thoroughly as you should. So if you're studying while the TV is on, and this is not really any new information, that really is probably not the most conducive thing for your brain to help you absorb all the information that you're reading. If you're studying and you're also looking at your emails that are coming in or messages or going to Facebook, you're really, really not getting the full impact of what you need to do. All of these types of things, short attention span, switch tasking, et cetera, none of that is conducive to learning anything, okay? Here comes the physiology piece. Physiology explains inattentive behavior. When you go into your iPhone, all right, dopamine is released in the brain. Here comes the debate about addiction, okay? It's not a true addiction where if you withdraw, you have all kinds of serious biological responses, but it is very close. Dopamine causes seeking and reward behaviors, meaning every time you do this and get messages, and it really doesn't even matter what the content of the message is. Someone's sending you a picture of what they ate for lunch. What's that all about? Okay, never mind, all right. But it's something small, it's just a little blip, what have you. And what happens is when you see and, and uh, cognitively recognize what's on there, your brain gets rewarded. Seeking, oh, okay. Even if it's just a little tidbit of information, it's not really that important. But seeking reward, seeking reward. Dom dopamine is being released in the brain. It causes pleasurable symptoms. All humans, regardless of your age, doesn't matter who you are, we all tend to try to repeat uh, pleasurable kinds of experiences. And so the problem is, according to Susan Weinshek here in her research, that sometimes people can get into a dopamine loop, okay? And this can happen to anybody. So regardless of age, whoever you are, the more you seek, the more you're rewarded, the more you wanna seek some more. And so that's what can contribute to people excessively being on their phones or being on their Facebook or going into social media and all these kinds of things to the detriment of everything else. People lose their jobs, marriages break up, all kinds of problems happen because people just cannot disengage from the amount of social media that they become involved in. Another piece in research, we find that self-esteem in young people is linked to the responses that they get in social media. Um, you wanna be liked, you want to have um, uh, uh, people friend you and all those types of things. People talk about, I have a thousand friends. Do you really have a thousand friends? Maybe you've got you know, a handful of friends in there, maybe you know 20 or 30 of them, but the rest of them might be sort of acquaintances or just plain strangers. But nevertheless, our culture today is, recognizes that as something that's positive, that's where you are recognized as, wow, all right, people really know you or they like all the things that you're posting out there. So self-esteem is uh, uh, built into this particular uh, activity. All right, according to Jean Twinge, psychologist at San Diego, San Diego State University, she has spent 25 years researching uh, Generation X, Millennials, and now Gen Z. She is the author of two uh, books on iGen and Generation Me. According to Dr. Twinge, she states, too much screen time creates less happy, more socially isolated people. Shaped by the smartphone and social media, they do not read, 
unless it's in short bursts or tweets or lines. They have poor attention and poor social skills as compared to other age cohort groups. Quote, uh, quoting from Dr. Twin, she claims there is a looming mental health crisis in the United States. Now she's not trying to say, oh my gosh, millennials or anybody else who's doing all this social media are about to become crazy. That's not what she's saying. She's just saying it is creating a problem of where if people are not out there actually face to face talking with others, you've got to have practice. Practice makes perfect, right? And so human beings do need face to face interactions with one another. It's a part of good mental health. And when we see uh, people, young people more often than uh, older groups, when we see them staying inside and spending hours having conversations with friends rather than at any time going out and being with friends, it does have a cumulative effect. And so this is the data that is found not only by her, but many, many, many researchers. Okay, um, brain wiring. So we see in a Harvard study they have found, and lots of uh, neuroscience, neuropsychology today, this is ongoing research. They're finding that the brains of particularly younger millennials and the Gen Z that's coming up, that their brains are wiring differently. When a baby is born, the brain is malleable, tabula rasa, it's basically uh, empty, it's a blank, sl blank slate. And so it's how we nurture and raise our children. That's what causes uh, brain synapse to connect, and that's how you learn, and that's how you develop personality. In those early years, if children spend, young children spend a lot of time on various kinds of social media, it apparently is having a biological effect. Uh, how detrimental is this? It's the jury is still out on that, but indeed we do have uh, some changes, all right. Um, <clears throat> Millennials do tend to have an entitlement mentality. It's really not their fault, not beating you up here. It really has to do with a lot of changes that uh, Gen X parents begin to make in terms of how they wanted to raise their children, a lot of social changes across our society. An entitlement mentality from K through 12, children oftentimes are told, try hard. If you try hard, it'll be okay. You'll get the good grade. Well, that's not really bad advice, but is it a guarantee just because you try hard or show up that everybody gets an A. That doesn't really happen in real life. And nevertheless, that is what was taught to them. That's what they were raised up with. Their parents, and we're not beating them up either, their parents became helicopter types of parents of where self-esteem became the end goal of itself. And so no matter what, you really, really don't want to harm the self-esteem of any child. There's a balance to everything. Of course self-esteem is important. Self-esteem is vital for developing children so they grow up healthy, they know they're loved, uh, and they can function in human society. But when you go off to extremes, either too little or too much uh, of this boosting up, you're perfect, all right? Well, you got an F, it's the teacher's fault, obviously, and so on and so forth. Everybody goes out to play, everybody gets a trophy. Oh no, we cannot run races because if somebody came in ahead of everybody else, everybody else would be sad. And so that's what has happened in our society in the last 15 to 20 years or so. And we've gone too far to the other side. And so what we see with this helicoptering and this accommodation and you're always perfect, it has created a think, a mind think of where, well, hey, you know, my other teachers always gave me a do-over. And I will tell you, K through 12 education in the United States is very guilty of that. They, in response, instituted within their grade levels uh, the whole built-in, if you flunk the test, well, you just keep taking it until you finally re reach a better grade, and that will be the grade that's recorded. That itself is not a bad philosophy, but when it's implemented across the board, it's mandated, do people learn that no matter what, they always get a do-over? And in life, do you always get a do-over? That's not the way real life is. So society in general, from parents to educational systems to just all these accommodations, we really have done a disservice to millennials because why wouldn't they grow up thinking 
that accommodations and, well, wait a minute, it's not my fault, and those types of things. All right, a couple of examples of maybe helicopter parenting. Um, this is just, you know, coincidentally, I just happened to catch on the news, you know, this past week. And the controversy about taking a knee uh, over uh, the national anthem and those types of things uh, in the sport fields, mostly in the football fields. Well, on this news station, they had a panel of moms that all had teenage sons out there in America who played high school football. And they asked the moms, well, what's going on in your son's high school and how do you feel if at their high school they take a knee or the coach tells them, you know, it's okay or the, to the coach refuses to let them do it? What's your opinion on that? And it was really interesting. Uh, lots of opinions, but one mom absolutely said, no way, we're a patriotic family, you, you have every right to express your uh, uh, free speech, but you don't do it out there when the anthem is played, you stand up and you show respect. That was one mom's spin on it. The very next mom that came after her was the complete and polar opposite of where she said, oh no, no school, no coach, no teacher is gonna tell my son what to do. If my son feels that it's, he doesn't want to stand for the flag or whatever it is, all right, then absolutely he has every right to do that. And if anybody tried to kick him off the team or put him in the locker room or punish him in some way, I'd be down that school, school in a nanosecond. So you see, all right, it's not my position to sit, say which mom had an approach that was better. You have to decide for that. But when you see that kind of mind think, can you see where children grow up with that? I can do what, anything I want because my mom said so, my parents said so, or somebody else said so. So these are some of the things that are being identified all right, out there in the research literature. These are not my words. This is what's out there in the research uh, literature. All right, a couple other examples all right, of I worked hard and um, I deserve a grade or some such thing as that. All right, uh, this I'm drawing from a colleague at another four-year university here in the state of Virginia. Cannot uh, mention the particular institution, but it is a true story. This is a, a close friend of mine, both the husband and the wife. Uh, there was a student who was in his last semester and was ready to graduate, but in my colleague's class, it was art history, uh, and two other colleagues across campus, one was English, I forget what the third class was, he just was a no-show. He just disappeared. And so my friend began, was dutiful, and they had their version of sales of where you notify and counsel and tries to contact the student. The student would come in sometimes. He allowed the student a couple of chances. He had missed a test. He had missed turning in you know, uh, some kind of project or assignment. He never turned in his rough draft, but the professor said, okay, just give me your rough draft. I'll look at it over the weekend. I'll give it back to you Monday, but you know, you've only got a couple days to get the finished thing into me because you're way behind all right, the due dates for everybody else. Lots and lots of accommodation for this particular student. Uh, the student did minimally uh, what he was supposed to do and then disappeared again. Wasn't seen until uh, final exams, took the exam, flunked, flunked the entire course. Just flunked the entire course. And apparently flunked at least one of the other two remaining classes. So he, now he can't graduate. And unleash the lawyers because that's exactly what happened. He came in, his parents came in, it was an explosion of nuclear proportions of where you know, the faculty member just pulls out, here's the absence, here's what was turned in, I accepted this one late, but he hasn't been here since, and so on and so forth, doesn't matter. It was the faculty member's fault. And so a lawyer, lawyers were hired on behalf of this particular student by the parents. Well, of course my colleague, uh, and friend was completely freaked out about the whole thing, but happily he's married to a lawyer, so he didn't have a big legal fee right there. The other two had to go and hire lawyers to defend their particular uh, situation. The student wound up graduating, because this problem actually went higher up above the faculty, because my colleague said, you're gonna have to fire me. I am not giving him one more chance. I am not gonna change that grade. I'm sorry, I didn't do it to him. I don't have it out for him. I reached out to him, I tried to help him. And the student just, for unknown reasons, just couldn't step up to the plate. And so, sadly though, the administration, in this particular example, chose to, I guess, not have the legal mess that was, uh, was brewing at that time and just rubber stamped him right on out of there. And it really was shameful because not only the student, but the parents are there. When they were showed, 
your kid didn't come to class. He, in this case it was a he, he did not produce the work. But yet the parents were going to stand there, and I'm sure they were upset because all that money that was laid out, it's not an inexpensive school. But the bottom line is, was there a, another message that that young man learned? Did the young man learn that, boy, if you have a big enough tantrum that you're going to always get your way? Even when it goes against, all right, set policies and so on and so forth. All right, so these are the kinds of stories and things that I, I learned uh, and through this past year and trying to understand, wow, what is going on? It's not to imply everybody sitting in this room would do that or is that way. Once again, it is data that's gleaned across a long period of time and it does look at different age populations, but they find more and more and more in the research that it's characteristic of millennials and coming up with Gen Z. You can find it in older groups, but not so much. So we, we're trying to get to the bottom of this. And so you can see, in sociology, we say, we, all people, are products of our culture. So you know whether you're raised in Iran or France or the United States or wherever you're raised, all right, you grow up and you learn what the values and norms are of that particular uh, uh, society. And so apparently, a lot of the problem is rooted in our society. And that maybe we have just gone, taken a good idea, and maybe just gone way too far to an extreme. Self-esteem would be that, that one particular issue. We want to raise our children's self-esteem. Everybody needs a good self-esteem, but not to the point of where I am perfect. I can do no wrong. If anything happens, it's because it's everybody else's fault, not mine. Okay, so looking at that, oftentimes there's a resistance to conforming to rules. Millennials do have a very high uh, a degree of wanting autonomy, wanting to be independent. Uh, another little story on that, and that's how I set my little program up. I don't know if you're entertained or bored. I'm hoping it's the, <laughs> for the former. Um, uh, a dear friend of mine and her 30-year-old daughter, uh, who I love like my own daughter, very intelligent, uh, a college graduate, uh, has her BS in nursing, excellent job in a major hospital uh, up north, uh, got it straight out of school. There was probably only a day between graduation and boom, she got this excellent job full benefits. Um, they loved her. They wanted to keep her. But she decided uh, after 18 months that I don't want to stay here anymore. She loves nursing and when we kept pressing her, why do you want to leave? Because, uh, can't say the hospital, but the hospital group kept raising the ante of what they were going to offer her in perks just to stay. She says, I don't want to stay because I don't like the shifts that they give me. Now, it's not like she's on the graveyard shift all the time or some such thing as that, but is there this old adage that when you are the new kid on the block, so to speak, when you're the new person hired, don't you usually have to put in your dues before you move up and get your perks or your privileges or what have you? And she couldn't come to grips with that. Old Auntie Peggy would sit there and say, well, honey, how long you been there? Well, you've only been there 15 months. It's a great job. They love you. They increased her pay, full benefits. They paid for her Invisalign bra braces. And you know what Invisalign costs? 8,000 bucks. I know, because I looked into it, and I went, well, forget about that. I'll have to do something else. <laughs> Tie a string up here. I don't know what we do. They paid for it completely, fully, but no, they sometimes gave her a shift that she requested, but were there a whole lot of other nurses that were there before her for 20, 30, or whatever years? And seniority does still have a place in the United States. It doesn't always work that way, but seniority is something of where you've been there, you've earned your dues, you've worked your way up, and so she couldn't quite wrap her head around it. And she became so unhappy that she says, I'm just going to go back to nursing school and get my master's degree in nursing. That's a really a good call also um, because, boy, you can pretty much write your ticket anywhere in America with a degree like that. So this uh, hospital, so anxious to still keep her, they said, hey, we'll cut you a deal. We will give you a full ride scholarship, all tuition, all books, to get your master's in nursing here locally in this part of the state. The only thing you have to give back in return is just two more years to us. She turned it down. 
Yeah, oh, I'm glad to see you. <laughs> you all think like I do. I thought it was just an old lady thing. All right. She is not bad. She is not stupid. But she is very much one of these. And she even said, Peggy, I just want to do what I want to do. And that's what autonomy is. And so we wish her luck. Off to Colorado she went last week. Mama is really sad. Okay, we hope she comes back. That's her only child, and my friend just lost her husband too. So, but this young lady is not bad or selfish or stupid or any such thing as that, but her behavior, even though it absolutely blows the mind of us old boomers, but it fits. It fits, and it's okay. It's okay for her to think like that, so we're not trying to beat her up. In life, we all have to make our own decisions on what path we're going to go down. We shouldn't be judged by it. We're not judging her. I'm just offering this to you as an example because that thinking, her thinking, was so foreign to the thinking of her mom and all of us old boomer people. Okay, um, here we see the last uh, comment here. Uh, uh, <coughs> one of our authors, millennials have the highest levels of narcissism compared to any group. That doesn't mean narcissism is you're focused on yourself. That doesn't mean bad, right? But it is kind of a trait of where you want to think about what's good for me first, and then you think about what's good for others second. We all do that. I do it. I'm old, all right? But it's the balance of the picture. How often are you putting yourself first as compared to putting yourself maybe second, okay? Um, looking at some of my examples here. Uh, a very good example of this. <coughs> Um, I should come first and everybody else doesn't matter. Um, this was one of my students a couple of years ago. Came in late every single time, 10, 15, 20 minutes. I spoke to her, I sent her an email, and she was so annoyed with me because I, why are you talking to me about this? Well, it's very disruptive when you come into the classroom. Uh, and I'm not, I wasn't blaming her. I said, look where the door is on most of these classrooms. The door is usually at the front. The professor's here working on the projector, and you know all the seats are out there. So when you come in, inevitably, you can't help it, but you've got to cross across and then go down the row and unpack your book bag and settle in and what have you. And I said, it's disruptive to everybody in the classroom. She goes, I'm not disrupting anybody. I said, I don't mean to say that you're doing it on purpose. It's just the nature of people. One, you're crossing across in front of me. I'm talking. All right, everybody looks, and you know they're distracted, even if momentarily. And then she got very infuriated and said, so you're blaming me because they have a problem with their eyes. That is a direct quote, OK? I got a book at home that I'm just writing this stuff down. I do not make this stuff up, OK? So, so I mean, I get so dumbfounded. I'm like, I can't even respond, because I'm like, what? What did she just say to me? And she goes, you're, and she's really mad. She got her hands on her hips, and she's just, and she says, yeah, you're blaming me for them. I have no control over those people. And I said, okay, I understand that. I said, but you do have control over coming in late or on time, and therefore there will be no looking of other people at you while you sit down, all right? And she still wasn't finished, because she said, but I told you I have to come from Phoebus, and there's traffic. Well, I repeat it again. Nicely and smiling, that's why I have an ulcer to this day. All right, I said, I live in Virginia Beach. It's 30 miles from my door to this parking lot, and I have the dreaded Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel to get through, and all the Navy traffic. But I plan accordingly. I try to, you know, look at the traffic or understand or guesstimate how long it takes, and then I add 20, 30, or whatever minutes I need to in case there's a snafu. She says, no, uh -uh, I'm not going to do that. She goes, I look at my phone every morning, and it shows me the traffic, and then it says seven minutes to get to school, and that's exactly what she allotted. She told me that. I said, well, you know, they oftentimes you know, are not always 100% in real time, and that just because you're in the car and you're driving, can something happen one mile up the road where somebody crashes or a dog runs in the road? Or She was not going to change. She was just not going to change. It was a very frustrating semester with this kind of thing. My rules were ridiculous. It was all about what she wanted, what she needed. She goes, it's a waste of my time to get here early. That's a direct quote. I even offered, well, you can get in, you can settle in, you can relax, and 
breathe. You can stop and you know, get a snack in the machine downstairs. Maybe you can just chill in your car in the parking lot with your Starbucks or what have you and then come in on time. Nope, all unacceptable. So we had a Dean moment with that point. Okay, all right. Millennials have little resiliency, poor coping skills, and that was an example uh, that I just gave that fits this particular student. Um, all the, it's not my fault, or it's the traffic, or the people with the eyeballs, uh, it's all of their particular kinds of situations, all right? Coping skills, that's a very important one up there. It's, we'll, we'll see in the solutions coming up in just a minute. That really falls to the faculty. Since it has been identified in research that, you know, not knowing what to do when there's an F or you actually get late points or horrors, it's too late to even turn it in. That's it, the end. So helping students adjust to, yes, this is a failure, but, and whatever you put into your classrooms, faculty, because we all have various kinds of, of tools and devices. Sometimes we do have makeup uh, kinds of activities. Sometimes we have extra credit. Sometimes you drop maybe the lowest score or various kinds of things like that. Point that out to the student. Even though you went over it on the first day in the syllabus, et cetera, do not expect that that is gonna be remembered, particularly at that moment in time. So pointing out coping skills, pointing out, even though it was futile with the traffic thing, a little bit earlier, at least it's something to help students try to figure out, well, what can I do to not cause myself such grief next time? All right, positive things, millennial range of worldviews. You are very tolerant of all kinds of differences across the world, across people, uh, across people's political kinds of views, social views, and what have you. And also, millennials are the ones that are out there supporting social causes. Millennials recycle more than anybody else. Millennials are very much concerned about the quality of the foods that they eat and GMOs and those kinds of artificial things uh, that are found in foods. They eat organic. They support all kinds of new startups. By the way, uh, business research, entrepreneurial uh, adventures, going out and branching into your own, millennials. Millennials are at the top of the list. Because they want that autonomy, they go out there, they have a lot of startups, and they have a pretty good success rate uh, with that. All right. But millennials still, because information comes this way, all right, uh, it comes in bites, it comes in little bits, all right, it really kind of sets you up to not have or develop, you have to develop this, good critical thinking skills, all right? It's that quick get a bite of information, Google it up quick, all right? Oftentimes when you get a chunk of information, you really don't know what to do with it. I give essays uh, in most of my classes, so students have to write uh, uh, essay answers to something we've discussed in class. Uh, usually it has to do with something that, that was verbally gone over uh, in a particular class. And they get the bullet points, or, or they make an essay in bullets. Every point they put down is correct, but just putting a list of bullets is not gonna get you the full points on that essay. It's not an essay. And the essay has asked you to integrate or to compare and contrast. Bullets don't do it. So there's a lot of frustration there. So faculty have that responsibility to show the student, yes, your information is right. They were able to glean the information, lecture, you know, notes, internet, whatever, but they have a real hard time integrating and putting that information into something like a research paper or into an essay format. Lastly on this piece, uh, there has been a significant increase uh, in the number of special needs students. A lot of it has to do with better reporting, better diagnosing, uh, and so that's good that we have institutions that offer um, uh, agencies and, and departments that can help serve the needs of our students that might have uh, some special needs. Okay, uh-oh, I guess I'm gonna click back this really fast. All right, how do we help our millennial students, faculty? Well, avoid death by PowerPoint. Sorry, I guess I'm getting an F on that, so to speak. But a lot of strategies that faculty use, most of you in here probably use at least a couple of these kinds of things uh, to keep things moving along in your class. Humor, personal stories, I tried to interject a couple, and they're all true stories, I'm telling you honestly, I've got a million of them up here, but I'm totally out of time with the stories. Uh, draw from current events. I tell my students, you got to watch the news in this particular class. It's sociology. It's about people. I oftentimes start the morning, even it's not, uh, even most students are trickling in five, ten minutes before actual class time. So I put up a news bit up on the screen, or I'll say, what do you think about? 
And so whether we talked about hurricanes or we talked about the shooting in Las Vegas, we try to integrate a sociological piece to it. Just something, just to get them talking. And it doesn't have to be with me if they all would look up from this. Because usually when I walk into the room, it's like death. Everybody's doing this, which is okay. It's your private time, I understand that. But you're sitting around with a whole bunch of other human beings. Maybe you can use that as a little social time, all right? Chat with your neighbor. Did you know statistically, uh, colleges are what are known by sociologists as marriage markets, and that's an old-fashioned old term, meaning statistically, for your age cohort, the chances of you finding a significant other are very, very high when you go to college. The bigger the school, the bigger the pool to fish from, and so on and so forth. But if you're there like that, not talking to the cute guy or woman sitting next to you, I don't know, all right? But I guess you can find them online. Maybe that fixes it. <laughs> and by the way, statistically, that's where you do find your significant others. OK, so faculty, we need to get ourselves engaged. We need to understand. We need to try to do better. All right, uh, model good behaviors, try to get off of our you know, pulpits and ivory towers. Just try hard on our side of it. All right, faculty, outline class expectations. We are all drilled around here about the syllabus. You gotta have everything written down, emphasize it. You gotta keep reminding students, all right? I have to keep reminding students. In my class, I don't know what it is. Everybody's ants in their pants or something. They're wandering in and out during just an hour and 15 minute class. If I can sit there through something like that, I think most people can, but I don't know. So I'm gonna have to go back and review that. But oftentimes it is just simply a matter of just reminding all right, students, these are the rules, these are the rules. Um, number four, as we said earlier, you do really need to have something embedded into your courses. Uh, the best of students can sometimes just flub up, you know, misunderstood the assignment, maybe we're sick the night before the test. You just never know what's going on in their lives. So it really would behoove their success academically. It's really no sweat for any of us. We're not lowering our standards as faculty. If there's something embedded into your course that allows them to, and I'm not saying, oh, you have to have do-overs, because I just finished saying don't do that, all right? But something else where they can bump themselves back up again. Because a catastrophically low grade can completely ruin them, especially if you only give like three tests in the whole semester, or one test and a research paper. And if one of them comes in as a 50, they're doomed. Because they have to have 100 on the final exam or something, and they'll still flunk. So we need to do what we can, all right, to help facilitate students. But still showing students, and using rubrics helps this, that just because you came to class every single time, in my class, that gets you one extra credit point at the end of the year. But that's all, all right? Sometimes it flips you over to the next grade. But I, I can't give you 15 points because you came every single time. There, there has to be an understanding that the quality of work needs to be X in order to get the grade. All right, do be sensitive to cultural differences. We are a very diverse culture here in the United States and other parts of the world. Uh, we all can get into trouble very easily um, as faculty to our classes, um, students between themselves. If you really aren't quite um, aware of maybe another person's background, here's a little quick short story. Uh, this had nothing to do with students. This had to do with professionals. I was at a, a, a conference, I was in the audience, uh, and there was a speaker, and it was about communication and those types of things. Well, there were two presenters, and as a part of the presentation, they told a story of how they got off as, as co, uh, co-workers, co-presenters, they got off to a really bad start the month earlier. Um, they had both met, and they were both working as a team, you know, so they were kind of new to each other. Uh, both men. One of the men was uh, Hispanic. And uh, you might say, well, what's that got to do with the story? Well, here it comes, all right? And so, and the other guy was a white male. Uh, and they got along real well, and they were really great team members, and each one took a turn. All right, one came up, the other one sat at the back of the room. Um, the Hispanic male was the second presenter, and his team worker, uh, his co-team member, was sitting in the back, and the presentation ended. And it was a round of applause. It was an awesome presentation. So his team member in the back of the room went, all right, A-okay, which mostly means that's a good thing. And you get in trouble doing this too, all right? Thumbs up, yeah, good, thumbs up, all right? It depends. 
In other parts of the world, you can, people come off the street and run you over on the sidewalk for what you did, okay? And even inside of the United States, we are different in terms of our ethnic backgrounds and where we come from. And unfortunately, to the gentleman, uh, the Hispanic gentleman who's presenting up here, he's seeing his colleague in the back of the room instead of saying, you know, A-OK, -okay, good job, buddy, and what have you, he saw it as some kind of an insult, that he was being called a really terrible bad name. So when the whole thing was over, he's just like this, and his colleague comes up, claps him on the back, hey, man, that was really great, and we did a good job. He's just slamming his stuff around, all right? And the other guy's like, what's the matter? You don't know? You don't know? He's like, I, I don't know. And so they had a conversation, and so here they are presenting it at another meeting, and it, they're great friends, and it was all fine. It was just a misunderstanding. So who knows? Any of us. Okay. Obviously, you support resources. Most faculty here are very aware. All right, the last piece here, managing difficult students. Sometimes, no matter what your great efforts are, once again with my student with the eyes, it's everybody else's fault with the eyes, all right, what do you do? And this was the point that was really killing me last year. So research has, and I've just gleaned a lot of these things, you really, really do need to remain calm. Inside, you're like exploding, like what is your problem? All right, hello, how clueless are you? I'm thinking, okay? But by golly, you do not need to be showing or saying that. You need to remain calm. People get upset be, they just because they get upset. We are not in the heads of other people. So once again, regardless of age, whether we're talking millennial students, whether we're talking about anybody out there, and these principles also apply outside of the workplace, okay? Uh, or outside of the academic environment, into the workplace, customer, client relationships, all of those types of things. All right. People need to be listened, and the real key word here is respect. It's interesting, back to my student who was always late and wouldn't adjust in the people's eyes, all right, she actually said two times in our very long conversations about, you're just disrespecting me. She kept saying that to me, and my brain is just like on fire twirling around trying to figure out. I said, and I finally had to say, I, I don't understand, right? I, I, I don't understand what you mean when you say, I'm disrespecting you. She says, you're calling me out because I'm late. And I didn't do it in front of the class. I always waited till the class was over, and I would say, mm, Susie, may I see you for a minute? That type of a thing. And I said, well, um, I have to speak to you some, somehow, and what you didn't see is that all the other students that were late, I have singled, I've pulled them aside also. Maybe it was days that you weren't there, or, but I have every single one of them. And I usually follow up with an email making suggestions or please don't be late or some such thing as that. But regardless of whether you know, she was off on a tangent, it was still her feelings, right? All of us, our feelings are our feelings. And so as a faculty member trying to get through the problem with, okay, what's happening here? You need to understand that. So let them talk, all right? There are limits, of course. You can't sit there for half an hour and argue, but you do need to have some limits. But students need to have a, a hearing, okay? Uh, tending behaviors, make eye contact. Standing like this is a death sentence, okay? Because you're defensive, you're closed off, you need not to do that because anybody, regardless of age, when you're upset and you're talking to someone and they're going, the chances are you're gonna get even more emotional and upset also. Reflection, using I statements. I did that in that example a minute ago. I, I had to ask the student, I felt dumb, but I had to ask the student, I don't understand, what do you mean that I'm disrespecting you? I mean, I really needed to know the answer, because I was just completely clueless, all right? You've heard the student, you gently point out, did you study the material? I noticed you have three absences, um, you left early on this day, you know, don't forget, well, three absences, uh, in my class, two absences, or excuse me, two tardies equal an absence. Ooh, I'm afraid with your tardies, you're starting to add up with your absences. Ooh, it's a, a divisional policy. If you, uh, if you have 20% absences in a class, ooh, you're gonna be withdrawn automatically. Oh dear, what can we do to, to correct that? So it's just letting the student know without attacking them that, ooh, there's all these things here, you know, you need to brainstorm about that. All right, uh, redirecting behaviors, there's a lot of literature on that. Um, sometimes just staring students down that are chatting or uh, acting up in the back of the room. Sometimes it works. Self-checks are pretty good. Everybody's just not paying attention. 
Is everybody ready? Y'all ready now? Questions? That kind of thing gets the whole class, what's wrong with her, all right? But that gets everybody kind of refocused, all right? If all of the above are unsuccessful, definitely do have a private conversation with that student. Again, pointing out those consequences. Always follow up with an email uh, uh, with the student. Always CC the dean and any other uh, academic administrator. In this college, we have sales. Uh, sales is an excellent device where counselors can notify the student, hey, we see you have absences, or hey, you're close to failing. All of those things will help. Okay, so coming to the end here, the whole point of all this, uh, from a faculty perspective, mostly talking to faculty, and I'm, I'm real happy to see a lot of you uh, students here today, but our job here as faculty, not just at Thomas Nelson, but across the United States, our job is to help you be successful. You're here, the tuition has been paid, you need to take that course, it's a part of your curriculum, you want to get a good grade, you want to take this degree and move forward with your life, get a job. So as a part of success, it's not just awarding ABC, whatever it is, but it's hopefully teaching also life skills. Uh, so faculty, I'm putting it back on us also, that we really need to try to understand millennial students and how they think and maybe we can kind of rejigger our classes and, and try to do a couple of new things to maybe make it less tedious or less boring because boy, it's not gonna change as millennials move through and on. That's what we got coming up next, all right, is Generation Z. Whoops, I'm missing my slide here. Because, and if you will, just bear with me for one, one tiny second, all right, if I can remember how to do this, all right. Uh-oh, I just disconnected something, Thurman. <laughs> All right, if I can pull something up for you, just real quick. I couldn't embed it in the PowerPoint, so I have to just do it the old-fashioned way. And maybe you've seen this, but it's cute, and it's worth... All right, of course. All right. I think I disconnected something here. All right, hold on. Here it comes, here it comes. All right, I got it, I got it, I got it. Okay. All right, boom. Let's go. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> this is a YouTube video, uh, and this is Micah Tyler, and all you have to do is just Google up to get the rest of it, it's very cute. But just Google up Millennial Song, okay? Or Gotta Love Millennials, all right? But thank you so very much for your time, I appreciate it. <laughs>